it was about halfway up the square that Shorthouse felt an arm slipped quietly but significantly into his own, and knew then that their adventure had begun in earnest, and that his companion was already yielding imperceptibly to the influences against them. She needed support. A few minutes later, they stopped before a tall, narrow house that rose before them into the night, ugly in shape and painted a dingy white. Shutterless windows without blinds stared down upon them, shining here and there in the moonlight. There were weather streaks in the wall and cracks in the paint, and the balcony bulged out from the first floor a little unnaturally. But beyond this generally forlorn appearance of an unoccupied house, there was nothing at first sight to single out this particular mansion for the evil character it had most certainly acquired. Taking a look over their shoulders to make sure they had not been followed, they went boldly up the steps and stood against the huge black door that fronted them forbiddingly. But the first wave of nervousness was now upon them, and Shorthouse fumbled a long time with the key before he could fit it into the lock at all. For a moment, if truth were told, they both hoped it would not open, for they were a prey to various unpleasant emotions as they stood there on the threshold of their ghostly adventure. Shorthouse shuffling with the key and hampered by the steady weight on his arm certainly felt the solemnity of the moment. It was as if the whole world for all experience seemed at that instant concentrated in his own consciousness were listening to the grating noise of that key. A stray puff of wind wandering down the amp street woke a momentary rustling in the trees behind them. But otherwise, this rattling of the key was the only sound audible. And at last it turned in the lock and the heavy door swung open and revealed a yawning gulf of darkness beyond. With a last glance at the moonlit square, they passed quickly in, and the door slammed behind them with a roar that echoed prodigiously through empty halls and passages. But instantly, with the echoes, another sound made itself heard, and Aunt Julia leaned suddenly so heavily upon him that he had to take a step backwards to save himself from falling. A man had coughed close beside them, so close that it seemed they must have been actually by his side in the darkness. With the possibility of practical jokes in his mind, Shorthouse at once swung his heavy stick in the direction of the sound, but it met nothing more solid than air. He heard his aunt give a little gasp beside him. There is someone here, she whispered. I heard him. Be quiet, he said sternly. It was nothing but the noise of the front door. Oh, get a light, quick, she added, as her nephew fumbling with a box of matches opening it upside down with a rattle onto the stone floor. The sound, however, was not repeated, and there was no evidence of retreating footsteps. In another minute, they had a candle burning, using an empty end of a cigar case as a holder. And when the first flare had died down, he held the impromptu lamp aloft and surveyed the scene, and it was dreary enough in all conscience, for there is nothing more desolate in all the abodes of man than an unfurnished house dimly lit, silent and forsaken and yet tenanted by rumor with the memories of evil and violent histories. They were standing in a wide hallway. On their left was the open door of a spacious dining room, and in front of the hall ran, ever narrowing into a long, dark passage that led apparently to the top of the kitchen stairs. The broad, uncarpeted staircase rose in a sweep before them, everywhere draped in shadows except for a single spot about halfway up where the moonlight came in through the window and fell on a bright patch on the boards. This shaft of light shed a faint red radiance above and below it, lending to the objects within its reach a misty outline that was infinitely more suggestive and ghostly than complete darkness. Filtered moonlight always seems to paint faces on the surrounding gloom, and as Shorthouse peered up into the well of darkness and thought of the countless empty rooms and passages in the upper part of the old house, he caught himself longing again for the safety of the moonlit square, or the cozy, bright drawing room they had left an hour before. Then realizing that these thoughts were dangerous, he thrust them away again and summoned all his energy for concentration on the present. 
Aunt Julia, he said aloud severely, we must now go through the house from top to bottom and make a draw search. The echoes of his voice died away slowly all over the building, and in the intense silence that followed, he turned to look at her. In the candlelight, he saw that her face was already ghastly pale, but she dropped his arm for a moment and said in a whisper, stepping close in front of him, I agree we must be sure there is no one hiding. That's the first thing. She spoke with evident effort, and he looked at her with admiration. You feel quite sure of yourself? It's not too late? I think so, she whispered, her eyes shifting nervously toward the shadows behind. Quite sure, only one thing. What's that? You must never leave me alone for an instant. As long as you understand that any sound or appearance must be investigated at once, for to hesitate means to admit fear. That is fatal. Agreed, she said, a little shaky after a moment's hesitation. I'll try. Arm in arm, Shorthouse holding the dripping candle and the stick, while his aunt carried the clock over her shoulders, figures of utter comedy to all but themselves, they began a systematic search. Stiltly, walking on tiptoe and shading the candle lest it should betray, their presence through the shutterless windows. They went first into the big dining room. There was not a stick of furniture to be seen. Bare walls, ugly mantel pieces and empty grates stared at them. Everything they felt resented their intrusion, watching them, as it were, with veiled eyes. Whispers followed them, shadows flitted noiselessly to right and left. Something seemed ever at their back, watching, waiting an opportunity to do them injury. There was the inevitable sense that operations which went on when the room was empty had been temporarily suspended till they were well out of the way again. The whole dark interior of the old building seemed to become a malignant presence that rose up, warning them to desist and mind their own business. Every moment the strain on the nurse increasing. Out of the gloomy dining room, they passed through large folding doors into a sort of library or smoking room, wrapped equally in silence, darkness and dust, and from this day regained the hall near the top of the back stairs. Here a pitch black tunnel opened before them into the lower regions, and it must be confessed they hesitated. But only for a minute, with the worst of the night still to come, it was essential to turn from nothing. Aunt Julia stumbled at the top step of the dark descent, ill lit by the flickering candle, and even Shorthouse felt at least half the decision go out of his legs. Come on, he said peremptorily, and his voice ran on and lost itself in the dark, empty spaces below. I'm coming, she faltered, catching his arm with unnecessary violence. They went a little unsteadily down the stone steps, a cold, damp air meeting them in the face, close and maladorious. The kitchen into which the stairs led along a narrow passage was large, with a lofty ceiling. Several doors opened out of it, some into cupboards with empty jars still standing on the shelves, and others into horrible little ghostly back offices, each colder and less inviting than the last. Black beetles scurried over the floor. And once, when they knocked against the deal table standing in a corner, something about the size of a cat jumped down with a rush and fled, scampering across the stone floor into the darkness. Everywhere there was a sense of recent occupation, an impression of sadness and gloom. Leaving the main kitchen, they next went towards the scullery. The door was standing ajar, and as they pushed open to its full extent, Aunt Julia uttered a piercing scream which she instantly tried to stifle by placing her hand over her mouth. For a second, Shorthouse stood stuck still. Catching his breath, he felt as if the spine had suddenly become hollow and someone had filled it with particles of ice. Facing them directly in their way, between the doorposts, stood the figure of a woman. She had disheveled hair and wide staring eyes, and her face was terrified and white as death. 